I've been talking to robotics companies both in and out of podcast interviews for about 10 years now. I hear a lot of things from them about working with venture capitalists and the mismatch in expectations that creates friction for founders and people in technology. In this time, I haven't talked to many venture capitalists, and I have not had any on any podcast I've been involved with. This interview is with Sanjay Agarwal, who leads the robotics and automation efforts at the venture firm F Prime Capital. This was an eye-opening discussion for me because I got to hear the other side of the story, and it makes good sense to me. My hope in doing and sharing this interview is that some current and aspiring robotics entrepreneurs and technologists get a better sense of what VCs want and are looking for, and that they and their companies are better off for it. I also found our discussion on the macroeconomic conditions affecting the startup and investment community oddly calming, even though it seems like we're in an unprecedented time. Lastly, we talk about F-Prime's State of Robotics report, which is the second yearly report that they've made on the robotics ecosystem. It looks at robotics investments between 2019 and 2023 and points out patterns and trends from their analysis. There were interesting results around what VC money is going towards and how that has changed in the last few years. And it was interesting to put robotics in a larger context with respect to other VC investment categories like enterprise software. My main takeaway is that the popcorn pops of successful robotics startups are just beginning and that the future looks exciting. This episode was launched at the same time as the State of Robotics report. The report is freely available online. You can find the link in the description below. Without further ado, here's the interview. Hi, Sanjay. Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, nice to meet you, Adro, and thanks again for the opportunity. Um, my name is Sanjay Agarwal. I work with F Prime Capital, an early stage venture fund based in Boston. Oh, yeah. Uh, tell me about F Prime. Uh, yeah, as I said, we're an early stage fund. Uh, you know, we invest across um, enterprise software, fintech, and then I lead our efforts looking at the robotics and automation space. Um, so we've been active for, you know, uh, actually we have a kind of a multi-decade history of making venture investments. Um, and in the current version of the fund, um, you know, we actually have a tech fund, which I'm part of. We also do a bunch of work in the life sciences space um, with a, kind of assist uh, another team uh, at, uh, at the firm. So, uh, but quite active, uh, I would say in early stage, typically doing series A uh, opportunities as a primary focus area of ours. Gotcha. So seed in A or just A for this kind um, of thing? Or mostly it varies a, bit? a, but we'll do seed and, you know, we'll, we'll do earlier or later. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Awesome. Now, you were saying that you kind of lead the robotics investment part of this. Tell me about, tell me how that works. Um, yeah, you know, so, um, you know, over the last few years, there's obviously been a lot of hype around the robotics and automation space, starting really with the AV market uh, a few years ago. Um, and so, you know, we started kind of poking our head in, into the space and just trying to get getting up to speed. And my personal background actually was, uh, earlier in my career, I was actually working as a robotics engineer at a company that focused on manufacturing automation. Uh, so I had sort of firsthand experience with, you know, call it the earlier generation of, of robotics and automation solutions. So I had a kind of a, a natural affinity toward the space. And so um, I, I kind of led the effort to get ourselves up to speed and started really looking at the AV space and had made a couple of, you know, smallish investments there. But uh, an AV, was, that's autonomous vehicles, yeah, sorry, right? Okay, so yeah. Just yeah, acronyms. autonomous vehicles, um, exactly. Um, and we spent a lot of time there. Uh, I think as we dug deeper there, we kind of came to the conclusion that we preferred more industrial sort of use cases and have spent most of the more recent uh, history uh, focused on those sorts of, you know, looking at logistics and construction and agriculture uh, oriented use cases for robotics. Awesome. Okay, so I want to come back to this, but tell me how you, so you mentioned you were working in the robotic space. Tell me how... Tell me what your path has been. So how'd you go from like being involved in robotics and where'd you go from there? 
Um, yeah, so, you know, as I said, I, I mean, I did a degree in mechanical engineering and, and majored in control systems. And so robotics was kind of a natural, you know, starting point for my own career. Um, it was, uh, you know, in, in, in those days, and robotics is not a new concept. You know, obviously, it's been around for, for generations. Um, and so, you know, it was very kind of standardized, you know, repetitive task, but you could, you know, automate it in more sophisticated ways. Uh, but it was um, very, you know, just re re repetitive tasks, I guess, was a focus in those days. Um, mm -hmm. And we built, you know, all sorts of systems for, you know, semiconductor wafer handling and optical fiber manufacturing and, and, and these sorts of things um, in those days. Um, but after a while, I decided I just, you know, wanted to get more into the business side of things. So I went to business school, worked at consulting for a while, um, eventually ended up uh, moving to India uh, to start a company uh, focused on the mobile messaging space uh, hmm. and spent a few years there. Um, and after how did I you how did you make that decision to do that? It seems like a big leap. Um, I'm curious what you were thinking at the time. Um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I, I guess I always had the itch in some ways, uh, to do something entrepreneurial and the company I worked for initially out of school was a startup. Um, and so the opportunity kind of presented itself with somebody I knew, uh, uh in India that was starting this business. Um, and so it was sort of just, uh, kind of took a leap of faith and said, okay, let's, let's give this a try. Um, so cool. Try something, uh, some, try something a little bit different than what I had been doing. Um, which turned out to be a fantastic experience and really, you know, rewarding both, you know, personally for sure. Um, and so did that and really got a firsthand experience of what it meant to kind of build and run a startup. Uh, and so when we exited that business and I came back to Boston, uh, I hooked up with a team and I knew some of the folks that already uh, at F prime and then started working on the investment side of things and, and ho hopefully leveraging some of my own experiences from the, from the startup world. Why did you move over to investment? What did you, so leveraging your experiences from the startup world, but like, what was kind of the motivation there? What were you, what was the appeal of venture capital as opposed to just like starting another startup or something like this? How did you look at it? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just certainly didn't set out to become an investor, I would say. Um, it was a little bit more opportunistic uh, initially in the sense that I had worked with some of the folks that, you know, that were at the fund at F prime uh, before. And as I was kind of coming, I mean, I had to move, I was moving back to the U S after living in India for a few years. Uh, and so it was a good starting point to kind of get reacquainted, I guess, with the local ecosystem. And I wasn't sure at the time if I was going to continue with investing or, you know, get back into a startup. And I think as I got more and more absorbed, uh, into investing, just in, enjoyed it, you know, like you, it's a great, opportunity to learn, you know, from very amazing entrepreneurs, you, you know, the, you know, the pace of change and the pace of, you know, kind of new ideas is pretty rapid. And so, uh, it just, you know, I guess it, uh, I, I kind of grew to like it more and more as I spent more time. And, uh, as I said, it's like, uh, it's quite inspiring to, to, to see what people are building out there. And hopefully I can provide some useful perspective from my own personal experiences, uh, as well. Hell yeah. Yeah. I feel like one of the other things that I, I don't know what your perspective on it is, but it seems like a lot of people, if they go do a successful startup, now you have a lot of experience. Um, and especially like you being a strong entrepreneur on your own, you can go and you can help the startups do that. But you can also, now your interest is in robotics. Um, you can also be an expert in that or have relative expertise in that, which is probably very important for good investment decisions like that feels like a a big reason or a big benefit of you going into investment as opposed to someone who has no experience in the area making investment decisions or may not even be technical say yeah i mean i, I would say that venture capital used to be very much you know founders who became investors I, that has yep. changed you know and, and and the reason for that is exactly what you described which is that Okay, you ha you understand, uh, you know, at least you have experience on what it takes to build a business. Um, I would say that has changed a little bit over time. You know that you find more people that are kind of professional investors, and that has, mm -hmm. is what they've done. Uh, but I think the I think the expertise that you gain is more about business building as opposed to oh. industries. 
per se, right? I mean, in the sense that, you know, industries are evolving pretty rapidly, uh, right? And the and so, you know, I always I always believe that the people that have the best ideas, you know, for businesses are the entrepreneurs that we're that we're talking to and, and meeting and hopefully investing in, you know, where we hopefully come in as having some kind of overarching view of the industry as to where it's going. But I'd say the nuanced view, which really makes all the difference, uh, is really coming from the company more than from the investor by and large. Uh, and our focus is hopefully to provide them guidance on you know, how to think about building their business. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what are the right metrics to track? How do you hire the right people? How do you, you know, you know, focus on the right strategy to scale, you know, things like that, which are a little bit more, you know, kind of uh, uh, generic in a sense, as opposed to very specific to the industry. So we, so we certainly try to build expertise and, you know, in a, you know, we want to build expertise in industries, but, um, but I would say that, you know, at the end of the day, it's really entrepreneurs that have, have the most knowledge about the businesses that they're building. Mm hmm yeah, very interesting point. So tell me, so you said that you first, or did, was it you when you got first involved where you were doing autonomous vehicles? Was that your kind of first foray into investing in robotics? Or how long have you been involved at um, F-Prime? And... Yeah, when I first joined F-Prime, uh, we were not looking at autonomous vehicles, I would say. I think this has been maybe going on four or five years now that we've spent uh, we've spent looking at you know in the just generally in the robotics and autonomy space um, prior to that I spent time looking at other areas of enterprise software so there's a number of companies oh. that, in that you know across just the enterprise software stack you know things in Martech or um, you know those companies in the insurance space you know so a few different areas but uh, over time I gravitated towards this again you know given my own personal background uh, I found it to be particularly exciting and hopefully you know something I have some at least unique uh, expertise and uh, experience in. Okay. And tell me about pivoting from autonomous vehicles more towards industrial and manufacturing robotics. Yeah, I would say that um, I think the more we spend time in the autonomous vehicle space, um, you know, the more I think we realize that, you know, a couple of different things, and it informed our own investment philosophy in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, number one, you know, these are pretty hard problems to solve. And obviously, oh, that has been borne out, you know, over the last few years is, you know, as companies have shut down or faced a lot of challenges or just missed, you know, missed projections on when they're going to, you know, uh, release their products, etc. So I think um, the more we spend time, the more we realize, okay, these are kind of unbounded problems, uh, mm -hmm. which makes, you know, which makes predictability of, you know, hitting any kind of commercial milestones quite, um, quite hard. Uh, and, and, and related to that, then is just like the capital that you need starts to be massive, you know, really unbounded. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we were not like our goal was not to invest, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in these companies. And there's obviously some firms that, you know, are able to do that and have done that. But that was not our um, uh, our strategy uh, at, or, or even our capability at the end of the day. And so as you know, there was an early wave of lots and lots of startups. I think that quickly started to consolidate a across a few market leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, and as that was happening, we realized, OK, we're probably uh, you know, we don't have the capital capability to put that kind of money in, nor is it really strategically where we want to focus, just given the uncertainty about, you know, actually getting to market. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we leveraged some of those skills and knowledge. And actually, the work that I had done in my early career was around manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I had, a you know, my own understanding or appreciation for what that took. Um, and so then we thought, OK, well, why don't we kind of leverage what we've learned about kind of these newer generation of companies and start investigating other areas? You know, and so there's a whole range of you know, logistics as, as, a, as a notable mm -hmm. example uh, that we spent a bunch of time in. And um, we have an investment in a company called Right Hand Robotics in that space. Um, but it's a good right. example of industrial, you know, an industrial robotics you know, sort of company that um, that you know, that we spent a lot of time starting to explore. And then, you know, within that, there are many different industries that you can, that you can target. Mm -hmm. How did you start um, deciding on which vertical or which um, domains to invest in? So like logistics, manufacturing, maybe agriculture, like these kinds of things, they seem very promising to me, but how, how did you select from them as opposed to anything else? 
Yeah, I would say, uh, again, it was a little opportunistic in, in the sense mm -hmm. that in Boston, you know, there's a very good ecosystem of companies focusing on the logistics space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that was, has been born a little bit out of uh, Kiva, you know, having been based in Boston. Um, and then from Kiva, there were various people that kind of spun out and launched companies uh, in the logistics space. So a little bit was, you know, we're based in Boston. And so there are a lot of local companies that were focused in that area. Uh, and so it was sort of a natural starting place, uh, mm -hmm. combined with the fact that I think the, you know, the market opportunity in logistics is quite uh, appealing. I mean, if you even look at investment numbers today, it's probably the one of the biggest categories of robotics investment, just because of the sheer, you know, demand for uh, from e-commerce and, and the like, uh, mm -hmm. that is driving a lot of robotic solutions. And also Amazon, you know, kind of being the, you know, sort of the 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 bellwether for what other people are trying to emulate. You know, being very uh, yep. aggressive in in robotics. So I think that it just was a natural starting place. You know, partly just because we were in Boston and there were a lot of companies, uh, and so we started there, and then over time started to you know expand into looking at other uh, other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you want to? I, I would love to hear about some of the robotics companies that you are invested in in your portfolio. Um, Want to give me just a short description of each of or of a few of them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the first investments we made is you know was from the time we were looking at the autonomous vehicle space, uh, which is uh, in a lidar company. Uh, the company is called uh, it used to be called Innovusion. They rebranded as Sayond. Um, really interesting company. Um, you know, the founder had been you know working on uh, LiDAR systems at a variety of companies and kind of had his own perspective on what the, you know, what the enabling technology should be, you know, what the mm -hmm. right technology strategy should be for, uh, for LiDAR, because one of the challenges in LiDAR is that there are many different approaches that people are taking, you know, from the spinning LiDAR, which was the early days of Velodyne to other people trying to do solid state and, and, and other approaches. Um, and so, you know, that was one of the first investments we made. Uh, one of the reasons that we made the investment actually was that, you know, they had already been, in a sense, vetted by Neo Auto in China. Um, oh. They had kind of uh, looked at the market and identified, you know, they thought this was the company that they would partner with. Uh, ultimately, um, it took a little while for that partnership to, to take off. But, you know, today, uh, although it's not super well known in the in the U.S., I, although they are based in, in California, you know, they're actually standard on every single Neo car that, you know, is sold in China. So they've literally oh. produced, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of LiDAR today um, and have done have done really well. But, you know, like the LiDAR market, as you as you if you know, the LiDAR market is, is a pretty challenging market. You know, there have been a, there were a lot of companies that uh, that were launched, um, not, you know, many of them have promises of OEM contracts, et cetera. Others never got there. Um, but, you know, kind of it, it takes a lot of money to actually build an automotive grade sensor. Um, mm -hmm. These guys, you know, partly because of their NEO partnership have, have been able to successfully kind of get to that point. Um, but, you know, again, as I said, as we got deeper into the market, you know, we were really excited about our investment there. Uh, but over time, just realized the capital needs for companies like that were such that we then we started focusing on logistics in the first uh, place. Um, we ended up investing in right-hand robotics here in, in Boston. Uh, they make uh, uh, piece picking for um, for e-commerce, and so if you look, if in the logistics space, there are a bunch of different people making different kind of robotic arm solutions for different use cases. Uh, some are doing parcel handling, for example. Others are doing you know piece picking. Even within piece picking, there are different companies. You know, focused on let's say food or or clothing or 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 just you know general e-commerce goods. Um, you know, so right hand is focused on the on the, on the last. Um, so they, for example, recently announced a partnership with Staples, uh, where they're going to be. Oh, cool! Uh, the Good for them. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, really uh, impressive accomplishment uh, by them. Yeah, uh, and so. Um, so anyway, that, that was a, a good example of a company that, you know, really impressive technical founders, you know, it's mm -hmm. taken them a while to really perfect the solution, uh, just given, again, it's a pretty hard problem to solve, you know, because it's a problem you can't solve at the 80% or 90% level, you got to solve it at like the 99% level. Uh, or nine, a few nines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so getting to nine, that nine, last, nine, nine. The last bit takes, uh, takes a little while. Way longer, yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're in a company that we've invested in, in the, in the logistics space. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. I really like them. Uh, one of my, when back in the RoboHub days, um, I think I interviewed them quickly. Um, and we hung out a lot at like ICRA, the robotics conference. And they're a lot of yeah. fun people. I really like them. 
as a company and hope to catch up in the near future. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they had a, the most amazing office. If you ever went to Boston, they used to um, they used to occupy a abandoned um, uh, UPS facility. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's awesome. Quite, quite the cool <laughs> they had. Uh, but, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we have a couple of other investments. One's a company called Burrow in the agriculture space. So they make a small autonomous vehicle to help you know move uh, goods in either outdoor or indoor agricultural environments. And then the last company is a company called Taleo, which is kind of a hybrid uh, remote operation uh, and autonomy solution focused on construction and mining use cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, both very exciting. Burrow, it looks really cool. I'm very excited about the agriculture space. Actually, the mining space is very interesting too. So I, those seem like very good tasks for robots to me, just uh, to help it out there. And Burrow, it's it's funny. It's like donkey, right? Doesn't and so it's <laughs> yeah, like I'm a, sure that was the uh, kind of the tongue in cheek kind of yep. inspiration for the name. But but yeah, you know, there's been a there's been a fair number of companies focused on agriculture. And Definitely. Uh, meeting many of those companies, many of them are focused on harvesting itself, you know, so actually, you know, uh, picking crops. Um, uh, oh, that's from, super hard. Uh, okay. But I, yeah, I think we concluded that that's just hard. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it was hard enough in right hand robotics case in an indoor environment. Uh-huh. You make it an outdoor environment. Sun you know, and dust. It's moving and... up and down a, a row. Like it gets mm-hmm. really hard. Um, I think several companies have started to crack it, but you know it's taken a little bit of time. Uh, but I think we like the kind of the simplicity of what uh, Burrow was building, um, and it was also I think it, in our in some ways I feel like it was a it's kind of emblematic of the new crop of robotics founders that we see today, which is that you know Charlie, the founder of of um, of Burrow, was actually a farmer growing up. You know, so he deeply oh. understood. It you know, the, the needs and could really kind of identify with, you know, with the potential customers. And so he is very, very pragmatic in trying to build a solution that, you know, that worked, that could be quickly deployed, that, you know, delivered value, you know, very, in a very short period of time. Um, and I think that, you know, that kind of ethos was really what enabled them to, um, to get to market pretty quickly with a solution that, that's quite effective and was quite unique in the market at the time. I mean, now there's starting to be some similar players out there, but, um, but they've done really well. I mean, they literally have hundreds of devices uh, out in the field uh, today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so cool. So when you say the, the thing that struck my ears was new crop of founders, what do you feel like they're doing differently? Um, I think there's, I think there are two or th- there are a couple of things that we see. I mean, so it, it used to be that your prototypical robotics founder was, you know, they, they came out of a PhD program, had done robotics, had, had, you know, were very, very technically talented, but they were sort of, you know, a technology looking for a problem, you know, in mm-hmm. a sense. Um, and, you know, and I think that, you know, that proved to be difficult in some ways, right? I mean, in the sense that it just Poor takes a while fit. to navigate yourself to, yeah, what is the right problem? You know, how do you, because now you have to not only identify the problem, but also understand the industry, understand how do you sell to that industry? You know, there are many kind of dimensions of what you have to solve. And, and you know, like, I think the stereotype is that, you know, you're, you're almost too in love with the technology, you know, as opposed <laughs> to solving a, a problem. And obviously that's not true in all cases, but, you know, oftentimes I think, you know, maybe this, there's a risk of a solution being over-engineered for a problem that you're trying to solve. Um, I think there are two things that we see differently today. Uh, number one, you see a lot of, uh, of people like Charlie, you know, at Burrow who, you know, they're, you know, they, you know, they, they have a deep one. They start from an understanding of the industry, you know, that's mm-hmm. their start. Um, and the technology is kind of a means to an end as opposed to the, you know, end in and of itself. And so, you know, very pragmatic in terms of, you know, let's, let's build something that works, you know, without trying to solve everything. Um, and I think that has proven to be in some ways, a, you know, maybe they don't build the most, you know, technically amazing problem uh, solution, which is, you know, not to say it's not you know, technically strong, but they're not trying, you know, they're, they're not in, so in love with the technology that they want to make something that's, you know, that's incredible. They want to, they're actually just in love with the problem, you know, and they're trying to solve mm-hmm. the problem. Um, so that's kind of one dimension. And then I think the second dimension, which is sort of a, a kind of a, you know, actually a more an example of Taleo, which is that, you know, there, there's a bunch of founders that sort of cut their teeth on in the autonomous vehicle industry. Um, so they spent time there under, you know, like understood number one, how do you productionize, 
you know, code for this uh, productionized solutions in these industries. And so that, you know, gives the, you know, much faster cycle times, but also, again, are just more pragmatic, you know, because they, you know, they did see the challenges of the autonomous vehicle industry. Um, and so I think they, you know, tend to just uh, attack the problems in a more pragmatic way without trying to solve everything. Um, mm -hmm. you know, right? I, I think, again, very much informed by, you know, the, the, the challenges of, of launching a, you know, a, a autonomous vehicle for passenger roads. Definitely. I see it like um, robotics is really hard, but it's becoming easier. Yeah. And so now you're starting to see people that can come in with a little bit less technical knowledge or no technical knowledge and maybe get a good co-founder that has that technical knowledge yeah. um, and then they can actually start to provide value especially if they stick to deeply pragmatic solutions that often yeah. have tons of value um, just because they weren't being done or they can free up some hands to do some other work or yeah anything like this yeah yeah and again i think it you know like it has to be born from a deep understanding of the, you know, of the industry that you're serving, right? Like only then mm -hmm. can you envision, okay, what would be a solution that would be helpful here? Mm -hmm. um, and to your point, like, yeah, you don't, you can hire and you can find co-founders or, or engineers that can help you solve the problem, but it's got to start with an understanding of the problem uh, itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to me going from autonomous vehicles, um, just like, uh, like autonomous cars on the street to like Burrow, which is very practical and a much easier problem. It's, um, I feel like it's, it's a nice thing for the robotics industry because we're going from something that's really flashy and seems very big. Um, and I mean, when we solve it, it'll be just amazing, um, but very hard. And then yeah. Burrow, which is very cool, very practical, um, probably has strong ROI for the, the customers and um, probably has less risk for like less te technical risk as a company uh, than yeah. autonomous vehicles. So yeah. I like this trajectory in robotics. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of the irony of robotics, I, I would say. <laughs> which Tell is me that, about it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like as, as, a, as, a, as a consumer, as, you know, just kind of your layman, so to speak, like what you see are, oh yeah, people making humanoid robotics or people making autonomous vehicles where, you know, you, you know, you, you never have to drive again. And those are fantastic visions. Like I don't, you know, I find it, you know, like it's hard to imagine that those things won't exist eventually, you know, but like, but there's so much technical uncertainty that it kind of a little bit, you know, uh, it's not clear how it fits into the venture capital market. Right. Um, you know, it's one thing if because it's unbounded say, in a sense. Is that why, or what do you yeah, mean it's I mean, unclear? I mean, at the end of the day, from a from a VC's perspective, like they're looking for return you know, on investment. <laughs> yeah, they're looking for returns, which is driven by you know kind of the standard kind of um, you know um, uh, framework. I guess is like you're hitting commercial milestones at each point. You know, at various points along the trajectory of a business. Now, if it you know, if you have to raise a hundred million dollars to get, you know, to, to any kind of material commercial proof point, like, okay, that's, you know, that is not the typical venture capital model, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, you have this kind of big vision around, okay, yeah, there's just all these cool technology that you could build, but, you know, it, it may just be so challenging that you don't, you know, like, how do you, how do you marry that with the ability to actually hit some kind of, you know, proof, like market proof points in some, you know, uh, a bounded time with a bounded amount of capital, right? Mm -hmm. and so, um, so I think the the pragmatism of what you know what you see a lot of today in robotics is is driven by that, which is, hey, it may not seem like you know the the visions that people have about what robotics are, but they're actually solving very, you know, very real and very practical problems. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you brought it up with the humanoids. What do you think of a lot of the interest in humanoids and humanoids in general? Um, yeah, I mean, again, like I've, I've met a couple of the companies and, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty, it's quite amazing, you know, what, oh, definitely. what they're building, right? And like, I was, I was very favorably impressed, uh, you know, uh, with what, you know, what, with what I heard and what I saw. Um, again, I think the, the question is to, you know, there, there's always investors that are ready to make investments in these kind of big, um, 
you know, kind of a home run type of opportunity. And, and you've seen, I think, I think Figure, for example, announced an investment from like OpenAI, for example, mm-hmm. um, or you see Tesla, you know, investing in uh, in their robot. Um, and you know, like with Tesla, okay, like it's different. Like I think their their math of okay, is this a worthwhile investment is sort of a little bit different than an investor because oh, mm-hmm. they're their own captive customer. You know, for example, right? I mean, they don't have an <laughs> yeah. unlimited amount of capital, but they have, you know, you know, their 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 goal of ROI, so to speak, is not, you know, necessarily uh, as um, they can think in a much longer term way, perhaps, than you know your typical investor can. And so, when I look at humanoids, I think the question that I have is that it's hard not to imagine that they will exist at some point in the future. Uh, what's less clear to me is will they exist, you know, in any material way in material way, just meaning, you know, in terms of practical applications that are in the market, you know, solving real problems in five years, 10 years or 50 years. Right. And so as an investor, it becomes, you know, it's, it's a sort of a hard place to invest in, you know, mm-hmm. I believe unless your, your um, time horizon is, you know, is much longer or much more flexible uh, to do that. Um, and so again, like you, you see these videos that people release and they're pretty amazing, right? I mean, like mm-hmm. it's hard to kind of imagine like what people have created, you know, but, you know, but the, but, but making those systems do real world things, I think is still a little bit of a ways off. And, and you're starting to hear some like, um, um, uh, the com- Agility, for example, had, I guess, uh, announced like some initial pilot at Amazon warehouses, for example. And so, you know, it may be closer than I think, you know, in some cases, but, you know, I think, again, like my guess is that those near term use cases will be kind of, you know, narrowly defined, you know, very, you know, not not the vision that one imagines of a humanoid, uh-huh. but actually you know, pretty, you know, fairly, you know, kind of constrained uh, use cases to be able to, uh, to achieve, you know, some, again, some kind of commercial milestone. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to Melanie, um, about their humanoid from agility and it sounds like they have pretty good market fit with that. Like there's a, they, they provide ROI in a reasonable time frame. Um, but you're probably right, probably right that it is narrow in terms of, um, actual application application. And like, it won't be just doing everything in your house super soon. Yeah. I mean, uh, just as an example, like they don't have an artic, they don't have a hand, you know, in agility's case. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah. They, it, yeah, they don't have, they're not trying to articulate finger fingers. And so that's one way that they've, you know, significantly complexity. simplified the problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what they are doing is they have a very specific use case that they do, yep. um, which by itself is not easy. Right. But again, like they're pursuing one use case, you know, they're yep. not trying to do, you know, a hundred use cases. Right. And I think again, like the, the path to rollout is probably going to be look like more like that than again, what one might, you know, envision in their yeah. mind. Um, um, but yeah, you know, I think it's an interesting and exciting space, but Definitely. you know, one, it's very hard to predict, uh, how it's going to play out. One thing that I had heard, so I, I host spaces and we talked about humanoids uh, many times, but um, one of the interesting ideas was the reason, because a lot of investors have really piled on for humanoids in my, from my perspective, maybe that's wrong. Um, but from that appearance, um, a perspective of someone else was that the reason is because with humanoids, with the promise that they can go do general tasks, yeah. there is a potential for a much bigger return on investment for this kind of thing. Like their, their point was that most robotics companies have pretty narrow markets and therefore you don't see a hundred times return. You see a 10 times or 20 times return, yeah. um, especially if you invest a bit later in the company. But with this, the market is enormous because it could just do all like manual tasks in a sense. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think of that perspective? And I guess it probably comes down to timeline, but um, what's your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think timeline and capital, right? I mean, yep. yeah, like the, the, the concept, yeah, like what you said Definitely. is you know, hard, hard to debate. You know, the question is how much money does it take and how much time does it take to uh-huh. achieve it, right? Because if you just wanted to move in, again, I, I'm no expert on agility, but you know, generally what I understand is they're moving totes from kind of point A to point B. Right. Yeah. That's what uh, I, I am sure too. that you can build a robotic arm solution or some other solution to do that specific task, you know, probably in a, you know, equally efficient, probably less capital intensive way, but it would be a single use system. Right. Yeah. Um, 
And so as you try to build generalizability into many different tasks, you know, yeah, that's great. But again, like, does it take, you know, how long does it take and how much money does it get to, to get there? And do you just run out of steam before you get there, right? Yeah. And again, in some ways, like that's the, that's what happened in the uh, autonomous vehicle space, which is that, you know, like some of these companies have raised billions of dollars, literally, right? Yeah. You know, with the same pr premise, which is that, okay, yeah, if you can build a generalized autonomous vehicle, like, okay, there's this massive, massive TAM, but, you know, at some point- What's TAM? Uh, like just a addressable market, you know, oh. is uh, is massive, but um, but you know now you look at it and okay, it's been you know people miss their deadline, you know, over and over again, you mm -hmm. know, like you hear all the negative press with Cruise and Waymo and so forth, and it's like okay, you wonder people may just run out of patience, right? And people mm -hmm. and the money may run out, you know, and, to, and so you never get there. And so, so I think that's the potential risk with humanoids. I don't you know I don't know if that's what will happen uh, there, but. You know, again, like if you can build it, fantastic. But you know, do you, can you actually get to the finish line? Is, mm -hmm. is a question mark in my mind. Gotcha. Now, so you have segueing a little bit. You have worked, or uh, F Prime has worked on a state of robotics report. Yep. Uh, would you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I would say that as we started spending more and more time on the industry, I think one of the uh, things that we realized is that it's not a well-covered industry, right? I mean, the Definitely. data that exists for robotics as an industry is, you know, is spotty at best. Um, you know, so it's hard to know kind of what's actually happening. And, you know, and as an investor uh, or even as, a, as an entrepreneur, for example, like it's helpful to understand, okay, well, you know, how many, you know, how much money is being raised into this space? What are the hot sectors? You know, uh, what are, you know, who are the investors? You know, all, all sorts of, of these kind of dynamics to help inform your own thinking, you know, about how to, how to approach the market. Um, and so, you know, as we started dig, digging in more and more, we realized that part of the problem is that, you know, the, 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 the industry itself is not well-defined. You know, what is uh, robotics actually? And so we kind of undertook a task, you know, starting last year, uh, to really kind of do a bottoms up, you know, uh, analysis. I mean, literally went through thousands of deals to figure out like what is robotic, what's not robotics, and then create our own taxonomy in a sense, you know, around different categories, uh, and then use that as the basis for then actually creating hopefully a little bit more um, comprehensive and accurate uh, uh, view of the market. And so, you know, with that, we published the first one about a year ago. We're working on the second, you know, the the second re report now. Um, and we, you know, we created a, a taxonomy and really, you know, kind of create what we call three different categories. You know, one is auto AV, autonomous vehicles, you know, mm -hmm. really focused on passenger, or I'm sorry, um, public road use cases. So things like what Cruise is doing, but there's also trucking, for example, on, mm -hmm. on public roads. You know, the second is a term that we coined called vertical robotics, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, you know, really industrial robots that are focused on very specific vertical use cases. You know, so something like right hand oh. focused on on logistics or borough focused on agriculture, but they're really trying to solve a, a very particular use case. Uh, and the third is what we call enabling systems. So these are people building new sensors or new you know testing you know software tools for testing. Or a lot of people are building like development platforms for robotics. So they're not you know building an end to end system, but they are building tooling and systems that help hopefully enable the next generation of robotics companies to you know to 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 be more productive, to do things more efficiently, you know, et cetera. So, um, so anyway, it was a really interesting process. I think we learned a lot. I mean, hopefully the, you know, the, the investor community and, and entrepreneur community found it, uh, found it useful. And, um, and again, we'll, we'll keep publishing uh, our analysis just to kind of help, help everyone understand like what's really happening uh, in, in the market. And what are you finding? Like what have been some of the larger takeaways from the report? Um, yeah, I would say like one is like the market's pretty decent size. You know, if you look at the last, you know, f call it five years, there's been almost a hundred billion dollars, you know, invested in, you know, the broadly defined robotics categories, I, as I described. Um, how much, how much at each? Cause I'm curious if most of that gets eaten up by autonomous vehicles or yeah, so how that's, it looks. That was one of the big trends that's happened. Like it, you know, that was kind of, in some ways that was the spark, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. for the excitement cool. and the category. Um, okay. So if you look back, you know, four or five years ago, I think it was like 70, 80 percent of the of the funds were going into autonomous vehicles. And this is when, you know, the cruises of the world were raising billion, you know, billion dollar rounds. You know, yeah. so there's quite a lot of money going in. 
but over the last few years, like the autonomous vehicle market is starting to, you know, really retrench. It, certainly from an investment perspective, I think it peaked at something like ten billion ish a year. Uh, last year, it was kind of close to two, right? So wow. really, really uh, strong pullback. Um, that is. Um, and then in its place, this vertical robotics uh, categories I described has really started to take over and is now the majority of investment uh, is from cool. vertical robotics. Um, you know, again, logistics and there's a lot going in defense and medical robotics. Um, so that's that's been kind of the the shifting mix of where the investor dollars are going, you know, and then there's kind of a just sort of the, the macro headwind, I would say, in the venture community in general, which is like investment dollars are obviously, you know, Scarce. declining. Uh, pretty mm -hmm. rapidly, <laughs> certainly off of the highs from 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. I've heard explanations for that. One of the best ones that I've heard ever for an explanation for why the capital is so much scarcer um, is that the baby boomers are retiring. So over half of them are retired now and they were at their peak earnings just before. And then once they retire, they transition their wealth into safer things, bonds and treasure T bills and all sorts of things, um, yeah. and not risky funds. So then the capital goes away. Um, but what, how, how do you look at that kind of macro trend or what do you think's driving it? And what do you think the future of it will be? Yeah. I mean, that, that might be, I mean, I, I, I if, if that's true, like I, I might describe that as a second or third order effect. I mean, I think what, huh. I mean, the reality today is they're like funds I mean, people raise massive amounts of funds. So there's a, mm -hmm. a ton of so-called dry powder, meaning that, you know, funds that were raised that have not yet been deployed uh, into investment. So there's no so shortage of cap. Sorry, there's no shortage of capital. Uh, OK, um, I think what happened was that. You know, there, you know, like there's a this market euphoria, you know, literally, you know, <laughs> it was a bubble, basically. Yeah, like late 2020, late, you know, 2021. Um, and so what happened is like the dollars kind of went through the roof and along with it, you know, valuations really you know, shot soared. Up. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some of the traditional fundamentals that people, you know, investors were looking for around, again, you know, kind of market traction, et cetera, you know, were, were put aside to some extent, you know, as people, you know, were chasing, you know, the hot deal, so to speak. Um, and now as the, as the public markets corrected, you know, like then the private markets tend to, you know, correct as well. And so, you know, what you see generally in the invest mm. in the venture markets is that, when you look at very early stage deals like Seed and Series A, they've actually been pretty robust. Actually, they haven't really changed really okay. over the last couple of years because, you know, at, at those stages, people aren't looking for you know uh, revenue tar you know re revenue figures or whatever. Like they're kind of investing in a concept, a team, you know, a, a market, etc. Um, and you know, combined with the fact that there is tons of of capital out there to be deployed. And so that part of the market has been relatively less affected and maybe even not affected, you know, uh, in a sense. Uh, but as you get into later- You said seed and A, and typically? A, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, so those, so later those ones. Tons, yeah, like B the amount of money that's gone into those stages have been kind of flat. You know, even Is that it the, in robotics you're saying or in startups in general? It, or? It's definitely true in robotics and in general uh, in the broader market. I don't have the exact numbers, but, you know, yeah, generally- Yeah, just your feeling is interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. But as you get into later stages, like B, C, D, and beyond, you know, mm -hmm. that's where you start to have challenges, which is that, you know, maybe the company was overvalued, you know, in a, in a previous round, or at least overvalued relative to current valuation metrics. And so now, you know, there's a, there's a disconnect between what the investor is ready to pay and what the founder is wanting to raise at. And so it just creates friction, you know, in terms of, of raising rounds. Uh, maybe the metrics never never were what they should have been, and they didn't really improve the metrics over the last couple of years. And so, you know, it just becomes hard for companies to raise money at all. Um, and so there's been a real slowdown in those kind of later, you know, mid to late stage rounds as I think kind of price discovery has been kind of an ongoing process, you know, again, mm. just meaning how much the investor wants to pay versus how much the founder, you know, uh, wants to raise at. Um, and, you know, and then also people were kind of raising, because of those dynamics, people were raising extension rounds, essentially, which is, oh. you know, well, the existing investors put in a few million dollars more so I can extend my runway before I have to raise again. So that just yeah. created a, a delay, you know, effectively um, in when rounds were being raised. Interesting. I've heard one of the things related to what you're saying that I've heard about, and not sure again if it's true. Um, but a lot of companies in this kind of peak 2021 era 
um, they raised at ridiculous evaluations. And so what they would have to do to get another round of investment is often do a down round. So they would have to accept a smaller valuation than they got at the previous round. And no one likes that bad for all the previous investors and looks bad for the company. Um, yeah, so that, so yeah so that, that's a perfect example it just it just slows i mean uh, eventually the company needs money right yep. I mean, so and, <laughs> and in 2021 they raised people raised very large rounds and so the runway that they had was maybe long I mean, typically it would be like 18 24 months maybe they had 36 months of runway or 48 months of runway especially as wow. they started to cost just because the round sizes were so big massive you know, so, yeah so they were kind of able to kick the can down the road so to speak but eventually you know you you know, either you get the profitability or you have to raise. And then the reality of I might have to raise a down round, you know, you, it's unavoidable at that point. And yep. I think that's where we're, we're kind of working. The market is working its way through all of that. And Interesting. You know, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, like late 2024, like you'll see more of that happening or companies will just go out of business, you know, which yep. you, know, you see. That happens too. You're seeing more and more of that uh, today as well. Yeah, it feels like a lot of companies are being squeezed, maybe because of this. It's like too much fertilizer or something. It grows too fast. Yeah. And it's not, uh, and then it needs more, and then it can't get as much. So then it dies, this kind of thing. Yeah. What do you think? Um, so I, actually, it sounds like you're saying that this is kind of a necessary correction, in a sense, in the markets or in the valuations, because they were in a bubble effectively and so that that bubble has to be worked out in a sense um yeah, and then after yes. things will kind of return to normal we're assuming or what what kind of thing yeah i mean I don't, i'm not sure what normal will be it will be. <laughs> there'll be some there'll be a new normal a new normal i suppose um but yeah you know, it's unlike in public markets where like there's like a real-time pricing that's happening like public private markets aren't subject to that right and mm-hmm. so you know, they just they just have a way of taking more time to, you know, for that process to play out. Um, but it's happening. I mean, this is why people are, you know, you see layoffs because people are trying to cut the burn to extend the runway to get to better metrics. I mean, it's sort of a hopefully a healthy oh. thing for the market as a whole as companies build more sustainable business models. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it can certainly be a painful process at the same time. For individuals and maybe companies. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, what do you, so one thing that's interesting, and I don't know if it's related, but I'm curious to think, see if you do think it's related. Um, it's been many, com- I, I've been hearing that most companies are, are like, it's very hard to IPO now. Um, yeah. it, it seems like companies are not IPOing. Um, is that shaped by similar forces because maybe their valuation is lower and they don't want to do the down round or something with the uh, evaluation at the IPO, or I don't know exactly how it works, but any, any thoughts on why IPOs may not be happening as frequently? Lately? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's definitely a the dynamic you described, which is that, okay, the valuation that you might get at the IPO may not be appealing, you know, certainly relative to your, you know, the last round or what your expectations were. So I think there's that part of it. Uh, I think that the other part of it is the market itself, right? Is the mm-hmm. market ready to invest in these companies? And so, you know, and I think there's a, a huge, uh, I mean, one, one of the things that F prime does actually is spends a lot of time in the FinTech space. So we just published a FinTech report also. I mean, huh. and, you know, and there's like a huge backlog of coming, like you take Stripe as kind of the poster child of the FinTech, you know, era, you know, there's, you know, they've, they've been, uh, you know, rumored to want to go public for quite a long time, but they haven't I've yet, you know, partly because mm-hmm. the market, you know, they probably could go public at any time, but, you know, they probably have certain expectations about, you know, what, what valuation they, they want. And, you know, so part of it is the market itself, like how, how much appetite is there from the market side to support, you know, to support these companies and to, you know, give them, you know, attractive uh, valuation. So I, I think yeah. it's, you know, it seems like it's starting a little bit. I mean, there've been a few recently, if I, if I remember, but, um, but yeah, I think the I think you know for, as a VC, like your exit you know path ideally is either M and A or IPO. And so if the mm-hmm. IPO markets are slow, like that affects obviously how you think about you know your your exits and your timelines and uh, and how much you can exit for. And M and A has also been sl- quite slowed as a lot of the large corporate buyers are you know have similarly kind of slowed their you know potential. They're they're subject yeah. to the same forces too. Yeah, so exactly. Not, their, their own stock mm-hmm. might be down. You know, they they have investor pressure to reduce cost. 
um, the regulatory challenge. You know, so there are all, all sorts of kind of headwinds, I would say, in the exit market more broadly, yeah. uh, which is very market driven, I would say. How do you think, and we'll go back into robotics, but I'm curious about all your market uh, or ec economy point of view. I'm, I'm curious about your economics takes. Um, oh, how do you think the high interest rates are affecting things? Um, like, what do you, to me, it, it makes it so people are investing in more things that are lower risk and more likely to do better than kind of like, I've heard a lot of things described as like zero interest phenomenons because cash was so cheap that like, yeah. just throw it at anything. And, um, now it's like, you need something valuable and I feel like it's actually doing well for robotics, but I, like, I feel like this has been like robotics has been doing okay, but I'm curious about your thoughts on this and on the interest rates and how it's been affecting things. Yeah, I, mean, I think at a simplistic level, like you said, I mean, the money used to be, you know, free, so to speak. I mean, there was, mm -hmm. you know, no, no cost to, I mean, even if you want to borrow money, you know, the interest rates on borrowing were, were Super quite low. low, or you were taking, you know, equity money, et cetera. But, or negative yeah. interest rates in some silly places occasionally. <laughs> yeah, but. exactly. But, but yeah, I think it, I think, the, I think the, I mean, the simplistic way that it affects things is people, you know, the people are looking for a faster path to profitability, right? Where you're not burning money, but you're actually making money, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it just drive the behavior that, you know, at least certainly investors are expecting is, you know, more capital efficient businesses, you know, lower burn, you know, some, you know, you know, maybe being able to on your last round get to, you know, get to profitability if you had to, um, but just, um, you know, a less focus on growth at all costs, so to speak, and, and more focus on, kind of capital uh, efficient growth, you know, and hopefully hitting some level of, you know, profitability of, you know, in the, and depending on which stage, obviously, but, you know, in the, in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And growth at all costs to me implies looking for a bigger multiple. So they're looking for a hundred or a thousand times on their investment or something like this, whereas more profitable probably implies a profitable, like lower risk would make it so that maybe it's a lower um, return. So do you think that um, the venture capital model is gonna be changing or maybe the average goes higher because all of the ones do not unicorns, but all of the companies become not unicorns, but become 10X to 20X instead of most of them failing and some of them being 200X or something yeah. like that. What are your thoughts around maybe a changing venture capital model or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm probably don't have a super informed perspective on that per se, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, at the, at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I think in the, in the, in the last few years, you saw some really significant exits, um, you know, through very high valuation multiples. Right. And so, uh, so that drove some really great returns, you know, I think for a lot of investors, but that was uh, abnormal. Right, that was not the way I would say invest. You know, uh, exits worked historically. Like there was a huge run up, a bubble. You know, whatever you want to call it. You know, so that. So I don't. You know, I think we're going back to what was normal, <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> you know, what was abnormal, perhaps a couple of uh, a couple of years ago. So I don't. I'm not sure that you know it's the companies are any more or less risky. You know, per se, but but rather uh, you know kind of valuation multiples are back to what they used to be you know uh, a few years ago or getting closer to what they used to be a few years ago and so you know and, and correlated to that was companies didn't raise so much money you know to mm -hmm. get them right so you know doesn't mean you can't still get a great return but i think it's you just do it in a more capital efficient way you know rather than raising 100 million you raise 50 million you know or, or whatever it is um, uh, to achieve a, a, an interesting outcome mhm mm yeah, interesting. Do you think that this will adjust the timeline at all? So if you grow at any cost, this means to me, maybe you scale quicker. But if you take 50 million, maybe you have to scale a little slower and a little more efficiently. Um, and it probably takes longer. Um, I have always heard that uh, VC uh, venture capitalists want like it's like a seven-year timeline for funds or something when they they invest and then they expect and i'm sure it depends on the stage but yeah. they expect that there's a merger and acquisition or an ipo or someone buys it or whatever it might be yeah. um do you think the timeline is going to start changing is it going to go longer or does it stay kind of this i, I don't know it just 
seems like something has to give and like i i don't know i don't or it seems like there's a trade-off in some way but i don't and i'm yeah. not sure i fully understand but what do you think yeah but, but but again i would say that um i mean that that was always the norm right like i think oh. we're going back to what the market used to be you know as opposed to this kind of silly period in in the middle um interesting and so i don't i don't think it changes the model i think it just you know people have to you know, uh, reset their expectations because if your expectation is based on what happened in you know in the last you know like four or five years ago, then that may not that may have that's probably not the right expectation and historically was not the right expectation either. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the exit timeline ultimately is is almost more a function of kind of market dynamics, which kind of you know which and the market is cyclical in a sense, right? Like so. If M and A's are plentiful, then yeah, your timeline to exit is going to be, be shorter, be potentially faster, you know. But if the market, you know, the M and A market dries up in the way that it has the last couple of years, you know, then you're going to have to wait longer. So I don't, you know, so it's it it is kind of correlated to what you're describing in terms of how fast you're growing. But I think it's probably even more driven by the exit, you know, the health of the exit market, you know, whether it's M and A or IPO. And if the IPO market's closed, it's closed. Like there's nothing much you can do about it, no matter how <laughs> yeah. fast or slow you're growing. Yeah, for sure. What do you, um, so one thing that I've heard, which I thought was very interesting is that, so you guys F prime are investing in seed and series a typically. Um, and it strikes me that there's quite a lot of, um, investment firms that are investing in robotics companies at series a and seed levels. Yeah. And it mm -hmm. seems like when you go BC, it gets a bit harder and maybe you go to like, I don't know, Sequoia or some of these really large ones for these later rounds. Uh, how do you think about this? And what do you think around the idea of series B and beyond being very hard for robotics companies? Yeah, I mean, I, too. yeah I mean, I would say that it's, it's definitely the hardest stage to invest, uh, to raise money in as a, as a robotics. I mean, you see that historically and you see it particularly in the last, you know. You're saying uh, B and C? Yeah, absolutely. Because, gotcha. and I, I think there's, um, again, like, as, as I said, in, in the seed in series A, to a large extent, like you're excited about the company, the use case, the team, you know, like, you know, you're kind of betting on the future in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and you see more and more investors getting involved in those stages as well, because, you know, as you think about kind of the, just the general tailwinds, you know, around the industry, whether it's AI or kind of labor shortages or these kind of things, like robotics seems like a great place to address and, and kind of capitalize on some of those tailwinds. Definitely. Um, and so you see more and more of, you know, more and more companies making early stage investments where, again, you're you're betting on the future, you know, the future, possible, what's possible in the future, you know, um, than anything. Um, and then as you get to later stages, as you get to like a D or E round, you know, by that time, you have, a, again, a different set of investors that are just investing based on the performance of the business, like how, mm -hmm. you know, what's the revenue, what's the metrics, all those kind of things. And so it's, it's analyzed to some extent, just like any other you know, a category of of uh, of company would would invest, and you even see private equity firms, you know, starting to get involved uh, in at those stages. And again, they're underwritten. Uh, the investment is kind of analyzed in the same way that you might in analyze any other investment. Mm -hmm. In the middle is the hard part, you know, where you started to get some traction. You know, you have some metrics, but not that many metrics. You know, oftentimes you have a big. You know, if you're if you're doing well, you have like a big backlog of contracts, but they haven't been deployed yet, you know, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, you have some new product that's coming out that's going to, you know, you started with a very niche product, you know, with a very small TAM, you have a new product that's coming out that's going to expand the TAM, you know, so mm -hmm. you haven't quite, you know, you're starting to hit some kind of interesting commercial milestones, but you haven't figured out the whole story yet. Uh, mm. And I think that's where the market is really getting squeezed today, which is that, you know, you know, many investors, you know, will come back and say, okay, great. We love the story, but come back when you've proven it, you know, effectively. Right. Yeah. And so I think that the, the need for commercial proof points, not just, Hey, you're, you know, talented team and you have a great technology and you have a great product, but I actually need to see real commercial traction, adoption, et cetera. I think those are kind of, uh, that's the, that those kind of B and to some extent C rounds is where you're just on the cusp of getting those typically. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have them, then, okay, like, you know, you, you may not be able to raise it all. And you've actually seen some shutdowns of companies, you know, in mm. those situations. Um, and, but if you, and if, but if you kind of have them, you know, then again, like you're, you're kind of in this, uh, you know, sort of situation where, 
the investor likes what you're doing, but they, they want to see more, you know, they want to see more traction. And then what, what inevitably has happened in the market is then companies will raise their series A extension, you know, so they'll go back to the, you know, series A investors and say, Hey, things are looking good, you know, but we need 12 more months of runway to, to get to more commercial proof points, you know, will you support us to get there? Um, mm. And so I think you're, you're seeing a lot of that nowadays. Um, and again, like the, 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 the challenge is really how do you get enough co- kind of commercial uh, speed and, you know, kind of those, the validation that people ca- can start to see the path of how do you get from, you know, a few deployments to tens to hundreds of deployments um, mm-hmm. over time. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. That BC does seem like a big squeeze. Um, and and we, see, heard- we see companies all the time that, you know, that are, or we did see companies that, you know, they're trying to raise a B and they still have just pilot revenue, yep. for example, right? I mean, that's a very challenging place to be. And, you know, some of those companies have ended up just shutting down, you know, because they couldn't, you know, there wasn't enough investor support, you know, to give them the, the runway to, to actually get to production deployments. Um, whereas three or four years ago, you could probably raise on that story. Hey, we mm-hmm. have a great technology. We're in pilots with these great, you know, uh, uh, great customers. You know, will you invest? You know, now I think the bar on, you know, performance is much higher. Yeah, very interesting. So do you think, um, how do you imagine this going over time? One one way that I could see it is, so like you guys at F-Prime, companies like Ally Corp, um, any, any other like Series A and Seed investors do well off of their, their robotics companies, maybe in like five years time. And then you guys grow into like a B and C funding and help make that squeeze a little bit easier? Or is it necessary to have that squeeze? Or like, I, I guess, what's the evolution that you imagine seeing of um, funding in the B and C space? Yeah, I think, it, I think it'll probably be a little bit less of what you described. And I, I say that only because, you know, just given the size of our fund, you know, so yeah. you know, we, we focus on a specific area. There are other like very large, you know, bill, you know, they raised a billion dollars for their fund and they are explicitly like multi-stage funds, right? So you have a number of those uh, that mm-hmm. will do seed and series A and series B. And so a little wow. bit of that dynamic may exist in what, you know, with those types of funds, mm-hmm. but they're not, you know, there are, there's some, but they're, you know, and there's a lot of capital in those funds, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, but that's not, you know, the majority of the capital out there. So yeah, like with those funds, to the extent they're investing in robotics, maybe they start, you know, they dip their toe in the seed in series A, if it goes well, you know, they start, you know, getting more involved in later stages. But I think the real, I think the real driver of excitement at the B and C is when you start to see more exits, essentially more, more attractive. Oh, exits okay. It all kind of flows downhill, right? Like if you, yep. if people see, Oh wow, that was a great outcome. You know, people made a ton of money on that company, and there's not one or two, but there's ten and twenty yep. examples. You know, then people can start to say, "Oh, okay, this is what success looks like." And you know, if we rewind the clock, this is what that company that just sold for a billion dollars looked like at the Series B. You know, this new company that we're looking at, you know, seems to exhibit some of the same characteristics, right? And so I think it will, it'll come more from that angle, which is you have successful companies that have exits, you know, they, they, they make a bunch of money for the founders and the investors. And then that kind of paves the way for more and more such companies, because people see what success looks like, essentially, and what it looks like at each stage of an investment. Interesting. Yeah, I I interviewed Blue White. But one thing that they were saying, which I found very interesting, is that they feel like they have a personal responsibility as a robotics company, I believe they just got their, it was either B or C funding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, they have a personal responsibility to keep going and do well because it ushers in more great robotics companies. Um, it makes yeah. it easier for them to get funding. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of, I mean, one of the, one of my beliefs as to why logistics is uh, such a hot area, uh, you know, in the world of robotics, logistics is amongst the hottest areas is because there have been successful exits. You know, Kiva yeah. was bought for a few hundred million dollars. Uh, Six yep. River Systems was bought for a few hundred million dollars. Like there have been exits. And so people can see that, yeah, there is a path to an exit, you know, in those businesses and successful exits. Mm-hmm. If you look at medical robotics, you know, there've been, a, you know, a number of very large outcomes, you know, of medical robotics companies. So there's, you know, again, people can see that 
there's a path, you know, but if you look at agriculture, for example, it's still early days, you know, there have been yes. a couple of acquisitions by, you know, John Deere made a couple of yeah. acquisitions, Blue River, you know, but mm -hmm. there were, there were kind of mid-sized 250, $300 million type of acquisitions, which were, which were great, you know, in many ways, but, you know, like, um, they weren't, you know, they weren't like the home run type of investment for the investors necessarily. So they were good enough to get people interested, you know, but probably not good enough to people to really pile into the category just yet, because oh. again, like the, the path to success has not been proven completely. Yep. And there hasn't been like huge wins, even though there's been some pretty good wins. Yeah. That that's been a thing that I've been hearing too, where you're seeing robotics exits that are like hundreds of millions of dollars, not a billion or more for this guy. Yeah, and, even, and even that, and we were actually just running the numbers. I mean, there've been 25 robotics exits greater than $250 million, you know, so it's 25 awesome. may seem like a lot, but it's actually a drop in the bucket in the world of venture capital. Like if you looked at enterprise software, the 25 might be a thousand, you know, for example, right. And I don't know what the number is, but you know, wow. it's, it's very small in relation to what, you know, the broader, you know, venture venture backed community, you know, has produced. And so it's, all it means is it's still early days. I mean, there are a bunch of yeah. private companies out there that haven't exited yet. Um, you know, but I, I think if you start to see successful exits, you know, in the category more generally, as well, as well as in specific, you know, uh, verticals, uh, I think that will, Kind of spur more investment um and it, it just becomes a virtuous cycle you know essentially yeah that's very interesting do you have any any idea like i i would love to see uh the a distribution of the exits i wonder if that's in the report but if I, you could see like this many at this much and uh, the, the yeah it'll be actually yeah, and when the report comes out you'll see it there oh i'd uh, love to see that some version of it in last year's report but yeah we did something a little bit more detailed uh this time around oh yeah um, and yeah i mean it's you know it's 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 good but not yet great it's still know? early yeah it's still early days because most of these companies like they were funded in the last three four or five years right and so yep. you know back to your point of it may take you seven ten years to get to an exit like we aren't we haven't gone through a full cycle you know for the most part you know mm -hmm. to, to really know what the uh outcome of those early you know, the investments that were made three four years ago you know, we haven't gotten to a full cycle to see how do those turn out just yep. yet. What do you think? So we're in early days. Um, what do you imagine the timeline is for this? So like the one cycle, is it a few cycles? Like from your perspective, and I know this is a wild speculation, um, but I'd love to still hear your thoughts. What do you imagine is the timeline for robotics companies? Like, how does it look over the next five years, 10 years, 15, 20, or whatever you think would be significant? Yeah. I mean, so we're obviously bullish. I mean, we spend Naturally. a lot of time and I personally spend a lot of time um, in the category. So <laughs> I, where I'm bullish, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will, you know, turn out better than not. Um, and like, as I said, there, there are a number of companies that are starting to reach some interesting scale, you know, um, across many different sectors. I mean, if, you know, in logistics, you have companies like, you know, there's a company called Gray Orange, which is, you know, doing well. There's hmm. a company called Locust Robotics, which is doing well. And there's a They're bunch great. of others that have actually, you know, have really significant commercial traction in the hundreds of millions of dollars kind of revenue, right? So you can certainly envision those companies, you know, having an IPO, let's say, you know, if not an M&A outcome that is, a, that is not a, in the hundreds of millions, but is actually in the billions of dollars, you know, type of mm -hmm. uh, Type of exit, um, and that you know that could be within the next you know couple of years, frankly, right, and maybe sooner, depending on the state of the the markets. Um, in defense, you know, you have companies like Enduro, you know, like they've raised you know they've raised insane amounts of money, you know, they were I think last valued like eight billion dollars. Um, wow. If they have a successful exit, you know, I think that will really spur a lot of excitement and there's already a lot of money going into defense related uh, robotics companies um mm -hmm. you know i think it you know again it creates that virtuous cycle in some of these use cases others like agriculture as i said like i think the 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 growth like the companies tend to be three four five years old you know so i think we mm -hmm. have another you know five years to go before you start to see you know what the result of those investments are you know those early mm -hmm. stage investments so i think different stages are a different 
places. Like AV kind of came and went, if you will, right? I mean, I think some of the early excitement in AV was because, okay, Cruise got acquired and Newtonomy got acquired and there were really yeah. big outcomes. And I think that, you know, caused, in some ways, caused investors to pile in, you know, and unfortunately it hasn't, it, it, it may not pan out ultimately, you know, but, you know, but as you go into other sectors like logistics, there've already been some initial out, uh, Yep. exits there are other companies that are poised to exit soon you know literally in Exciting. the matter of you know a year or two um and then there's others you know like agriculture where the companies are still really young and it may take another you know five six years to get there but i think if like if these things play out the way i hope like i think it will you know again create this virtuous cycle around people see that okay yeah you can have big exits you know you can make a ton of money you know as an investor in these categories as a founder you can see that hey there's a great opportunity here you know and it'll just kind of spur more activity. Mm -hmm. So a thing that I think is very interesting is that when talking to a lot of robotics companies, one thing that is highlighted very often is the labor shortages. And yeah. that's a big motivation for them. And I mean, if you look in, um, I don't know, manufacturing, logistics, like there are massive, massive labor shortages, and they're only increasing, I believe. Yeah. Um, do you th how do you think that will affect investment and timeline for these different robotics companies or i do you think it's a, a big factor too or how um how do you think about it i suppose um yeah i mean you know realistically like that's that's a pretty standard part of uh, your you know most robotics companies pitch as to why Definitely. you know why now you know in a sense um but i think what we've realized is that that's not alone to drive adoption, right? I no. mean, in the sense that, like, the solution has to really be foolproof in a way, right? Because it can't be, you know, it works 75% of the time, it doesn't work 25 because then they just won't use it at all, right? Mm -hmm. Like, in a sense. And so I think it's, a, it's kind of a necessary but not sufficient, you know, driver of adoption, ultimately. Like, I think that because of that, it causes customers to you know, try look for things, you know, yeah. look for solutions, try solutions. Uh, but if the solution but if it's doesn't, not good. Mm -hmm. yeah, if the solution doesn't fit seamlessly into your workflow, if it doesn't work, you know, almost all the time, so that there's very few exceptions, if there's not a good, like if the company is not supporting, you know, the, the, the solution properly, I think all those things necessarily have to be in place to drive adoption. Because again, it's a new piece of equipment that's sitting there, you know, it, it, oftentimes, like in manufacturing, it's kind of, it's all or none. Like you have a mm -hmm. robot that's doing the whole system, right? There is no alternative. You know, in mm -hmm. many of the newer generations of robotics, it's kind of a mix, you know, there's they're sort of sprinkled in with humans, right? And yep. so if it doesn't work, the person like take Burrow, for example, if the if Burrow's system doesn't work, there's also people driving around and wheel, you know, walking around in wheelbarrows, right? They'll just like say, okay, if, you know, let me, let me put this aside. Let me get <laughs> back to the old way of doing things, right? And so, I mean, it doesn't matter what the labor shortages are. Like, they got to get the job done. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think, the again, the labor shortages are, are a good uh, impetus, but, you know, you, like, you really got to, and this is where, again, right, go back to just entrepreneurs understanding use cases around, you know, how do you actually build a system that works and that fits seamlessly into a workflow so that it works all the time, not some of the time? Because some of the time is as good as never. Yeah. When, when, um, when does some of the time become enough? Like, is it 99%? Is it 95%? Is it 99.99% or, uh, and I guess it probably depends on the application, but yeah, how... I think it depends on your approach in some way. So I'll, I'll give you two, you know, kind of examples. Um, so we're investors in a company called Taleo, like their mm -hmm. explicit strategy. Just the mining one. Is uh, that yes, correct? They, yeah, they, exactly. They, they basically have a, um, they they work on any piece of large construction or mining equipment. Now think of an excavator, you know, massive, multi-ton, you know, hundred thousand, multi-hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment. And their strategy is uh, is what they call supervised autonomy. So it's basically a human mm. in the loop kind of approach where it's a you know, smart they, approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they retrofit the machine with a kit that enables you to operate the machine remotely, essentially. Mm. Um, and so what happens there is that. You know, you can automate part of the task. So the task that they typically do is where, you know, what what they call is, um, you know, like let's say you're digging some dirt, and then they have a process they call that they call tramming, which is like you move the dirt from point A to point B, and then you dump the dirt somewhere else. And this is done repeatedly over, over time. Now, for them, you can either do it completely remotely, right, and the human is there doing it, or you know, over time, you know, you can, or if you choose, you can automate the tramming part of it. Now. 
in that case, if the automation doesn't work for some reason, you know, maybe there's some obstacle. I mean, who knows what the reason might be? The human is there anyway, right? So, yeah. you know, again, 50% is probably not good enough, but it doesn't have to be 99% on the autonomy part because there's a there's necessarily a human in the loop in the process. So it's more kind of robust to potential failures, you know, and if you take, but on the flip side, if you take Burrow, for example, if their system isn't able to autonomous, like it, you know, if, if it's not able to autonomously traverse the path that they're supposed to traverse, then it, you know, it's as good as dead, right? I mean, there's there's no utility to the solution at that point in time. Yeah, That has to be much, much more uh, robust. Um, but even for them, what they do is like, okay, like it's a low speed application. So worse comes to worse, like they may stop because they found something that they didn't expect and the operator mm -hmm. can just start it up again and, it, and it'll just go on its, on its way. But if the system completely fails, like, okay, the motor went out and it's just, you know, it's, it's inoperable, like that's a problem, right? Um, that, that, is not, uh, that is not acceptable. Yeah. Now, I, that makes a lot of sense, but it makes me question um, why not just always have a human in the loop for this kind of thing? Like in the Burrow case, if it becomes dead because it has something unexpected, why not just always have a, like, what would be the disadvantage of, I guess it's more expensive, but um, why not just have most robotics companies bake in a human that can intervene if it does something funny? Um, I think you're seeing that more and more. And again, particularly in the industrial setting, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is where like passenger vehicle use cases, it was hard, right? And I think people yep. did create, you know, certain ways to, you know, have a human intervene if there's an obstacle that they didn't understand or whatever. But I think the stakes are very high, you know, in those kind of cases. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the fault tolerance, even if you have a, you know, a human remote operator is, is just so low um, that it becomes hard to execute. I think in an industrial setting, it's very different, you know, and I think this is why, you know, at least we see more and more companies with some version of a human in the loop, you know, uh, that can intervene because, you know, the, you know, if the system stops for a couple of minutes, like that's not catastrophic, you know, yep. in a, it's a very, it's a constrained environment, you know, there's, you know, like if it stops for a few minutes, it's not, it's not the end of the world, you know, it's, um, it's hopefully not a safety consideration and things yep. like that. So, Again, people have different approaches from Taleo, which is like, in, like the human is always in the loop, you know, by yep. design, you know, versus, you know, Burrow, where the human is in the loop on an exception basis. Yep. Uh, and I think you see, you know, lots and lots of these kinds of approaches, which is, again, why I think the industrial use cases have just proven to be, you know, more, uh, more attractive. Yeah, I think so, too. And it's interesting because even if, say, you are 50 percent efficient with a human operator. Uh, so it's failing to operate autonomously 50% of the time. Now one person is ma manning two robots, and then yeah. you can use that as a way to get into the market. And then you have data and more experience, and yeah, you can start absolutely. automating and keep improving that ratio. Now it's 75%. Now you have one person watching four robots with perfect math. Yeah. And it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, and frankly, that's that's very much informed our own view yep. of to invest, you know, people that are trying to do 100% oh. end to end automation. I think Very there are many hard. interesting solutions, but again, like the bar for performance is really high and it just yep. ends up, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, just being hard to execute, you know, versus if you get these kind, if you figure out the right solution that has a little bit more fault tolerance, you can have a human intervene. I think that just, that just give, makes the path to commercialization just that much easier. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. So speaking of that, what, what are some lessons we can learn um, and try to avoid in doing a good robotics company? The thing that I find most often is that, you know, when you're, you know, there's a lot of customer excitement for these solutions, right? Um, which is great. You know, like that's, that's a good place to start a business, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. But in the course of customer excitement, the customer starts envisioning all sorts of other things that you could like, why can't you do this and this and this, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the, the danger can be that, okay, you start chasing too many different shiny objects, you know, in a sense, right? So I'll, I'll give you a simple example. Um, you know, uh, Burrow, as I, as I said, is a good example, you know, like they, they make an autonomous vehicle, you know, their, some of their customers said, why can't you pick uh, crops as well? Right. Yeah. Why don't you put an arm on top of the system and pick crops? Right. Sounds sounds like a logical thing from a customer perspective. Obviously, if you're 
the yeah, machine. You already have robots. It's already out there. Like basically right? there. Right. Why do I need people to pick? <laughs> you, why don't you pick? But you know, but again, like <laughs> the challenge with that, that's like a very fundamentally different technology, right? Uh -huh. uh, like an autonomous vehicle is very different than a picking robot. Um, and so I think there's a lot of temptation, you know, for robotics companies to say, oh, okay, the customer really wants me to do this other thing. You know, why don't I do that too? Um, and in doing that, I think you can kind of get a little bit derailed uh, with, you know, not again, you gotta, you gotta be clever about constraining the problem in a way that's useful. Uh, there's a large enough market, but isn't going to take you down a bunch of different, you know, mm -hmm. tangents on technology that you need to build that maybe, you know, is, you know, just too orthogonal to what you're currently building. So I think that's what, that's what I see most often, you know, from companies, which is, Hey, like you're just trying to do too much, right. Um, in the, in the effort to satisfy customer demand, you know, expand the market, you know, things like that. So, um, that's by far the most common. Um, and then the second, again, is like almost over-engineering, you know, the, oh, the definitely. Problem, right. I mean, you know, you can, you know, there's always ways to make the system better. Right. Um, uh, I mean, better sensors, you know, more sophisticated hardware, whatever it is, but you know, what, what the right, you know, what, what's good enough, you know, is, is, is a tough, you know, is a tough call to make. And so, mm -hmm. you know, being smart about that, because again, like capital is not unlimited. And so you gotta be, you know, you got to make the right Pragmatic. choices around, you know, doing something that's going to work well enough without making it perfect. Um, so I think these are the, these, these are probably the two most common uh, examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see those two, and it's interesting because, uh, especially for the first one, where companies are trying to find product market fit, and the customer is telling them, "We would like this. We would like this," and so it's like, "Oh, I yeah. want to go find the good market fit," but it's like yeah. a yeah. complete exactly. diversion from what they're working on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Absolutely. Being that you are an investor, what kinds of things can a company do to make themselves very attractive to investors? Um, you know, again, I. And it depends on the stage, obviously, yep. you know, as you're, you know, so earlier stage, and again, like having, you know, deep domain knowledge, you know, having, you know, a, a strong technical team, you know, all, all of those are kind of prerequisites, you know, understanding, you know, like, it, you know, one of the reasons why logistics today is a little bit challenging is that, you know, there are a lot of solutions doing similar ish things. Mm -hmm. um, and so finding kind of a unique use case or market segment that you're going after, you know, that is not, you know, super competitive, you know, th these are just kind of like the standard things that you would look for at any early stage company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of going back to the question of, okay, what makes for an attractive, you know, B round or C round, you know, what I, what I always feel like is the most important is that, you know, like it's very hard to pitch a, a, an investor on a bunch of contracts, you know, that have not. Uh -huh. executed, yeah. right? because inevitably like yeah it's not to say that the contracts aren't real i think the problem is that you know are they going to get executed are they going to get deployed will they be renewed three months or six months or oh, not that even too. that i'm just saying that you know they've they've signed up to deploy a bunch of systems but like is it going to take three months or is it going to take six months going to take you know like it's kind of unpredictable oftentimes because there are all True. sorts of things that happen like you're integrating into real world systems and so you know, they may have other priorities, they may have to upgrade their infrastructure, they may have to change out, you know, maybe there's some integration with this other thing. So there are a lot of dependencies that you as the company cannot control. And so, you know, like, I think it's super important, not, you know, the contracts are important, but it's super important to have number one deployments, you know, live deployments that are in production, meaning used, mm -hmm. you know, every day, you know, not like once in, once in a while, but actually used day in day out. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, which which have high utilization, you know, which is not, oh yeah, we did it. We we tried it out for a couple of days. It worked once. Cool, and it, yeah. And we it's off on the side because, oh, you know, we have this problem or whatever. Like I think that's not convincing. So really focusing on, you know, not a hundred customers, but even just one customer, two customers that are like deeply engaged, you know, using the system day in and day out. Ideally went from one system to two systems to 10 systems or, or whatever the appropriate numbers are, but are like demonstrated a willingness to really go all in on the product. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for, for most of these companies, it's, it's really a land and expand where you start with an yep. initial deployment, you know, and they kind of, the customer tests it, figures out does it work or not. And if they're excited, they start buying more. 
right? Definitely. Um, and so until you can prove that, you know, I think it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how cool your technology is. Like that's the ultimate proof, you know, that, that uh, at least I as an investor look for uh, when looking at uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. It makes good sense. I would imagine more investors do that too. You want to see some buy-in. You want to see that it's working, these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, what, what, from your perspective, are some of the biggest challenges in robotics? Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are a few. I mean, you know, one is obviously these are like real physical systems, you know, so a lot can go wrong. Right? Definitely. <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and with that, like the cycle times are just longer inherently, right? Like there's usually a piece of hardware and a piece of software. And yeah, you can iterate on the software pretty quickly, but, you know, there may be, hardware issues, right? You need to change, you know, the sensor isn't quite working or the motor that you picked isn't quite working or, you know, the, you know, the arm, you know, is, is, is out of tolerance or whatever it is, right? So there are all these kind of physical limitations that increase cycle times. So I think that's kind of one thing that you have to be, you know, recognize and also figure out how to navigate, you know, to, to maintain, because, you know, startups are all about, you know, fast iteration like that's what mm -hmm. you know like that's kind of the mantra of of startups and how do you do that in a in a hardware oriented robotics company you know is is a bit of a different challenge but still needs to be you know achieved in some way um and related to that then is just the amount of capital that may be required right mm -hmm. um you know that you know changing hardware making you know you, you need a much broader set of people you know, not just it's not just a bunch of software engineers you probably need people that understand how to build like the infrastructure part of the software, who understand perception systems, who understand autonomy, then you need mechanical engineers, you need system integrate, you know, system integration people. So there are a lot of different disciplines that you need to hire um, combined with longer cycle time just means that capital, your capital requirements might be, you know, more than a, you know, kind of classical software company. And so how do you navigate that, you know, capital requirement, not only in the early days, but even as you scale, um, because funding all of it, you know, with equity alone can become potentially quite expensive. Um, mm -hmm. And so are there, especially as you're starting getting into production, you know, and you have your supply chain up and running, like, can you find other opportunities, maybe, you know, some kind of debt sort of uh, funding mechanisms to offset some of the capital needs that you have to, to scale up? Interesting. Yeah, makes sense. What do you think are some of the biggest opportunities for new robotics companies like where if you were an entrepreneur where would you be looking to start a company yeah i mean i, I mean and, and this is again like a little bit informed by what we've been looking at which is that you know areas like logistics i mean they're obviously there there have been the in some ways the um the most popular area of robotics but i you know i i, I say today like if you're an early stage founder it's pretty hard to find a net new use case that nobody has thought of um you know because yeah. You know, like there's versions of almost everything, right? So I, I, there's always there's always something new, but it's it, the bar is pretty high to find something that's different totally and new. better than what already exists in the market. You know, but if you're looking at, and that's you know, that's certainly true in in logistics or um, you know some of these other kind of uh, popular areas. But if you're going if you're going into agriculture, for example, it's still really early days. You know, there's a lot of stuff that can potentially be automated. You know, there have been companies trying to do harvesting. Uh, but, you know, there's other stuff, whether it's weeding robots or people spraying pesticides or Burrow does, you know, just moving crops around the field. So um, I think it's still really early days. Like those companies are, you know, still pretty nascent in terms of what they're trying to do. And I, and I, I imagine there's tons of additional use cases that haven't even been, you know, envisioned yet. So I think, you know, to me, like part of it is, you know, finding industries that are probably underserved, you know, from a technology perspective uh, mm -hmm. today. You know, agriculture being a good one, construction being another one, you know, where it's still uh, pretty early days. There are a lot of companies trying to do different food oriented robotics, you know, around, you know, how do you automate food preparation, you know, for example, or food assembly, things like that, um, that are pretty, you know, still, I think, pretty greenfield opportunities. So I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, part of it, in my view, is like, uh, I think that for early stage entrepreneurs, there's probably, you know, it's probably... Uh, it's just, they're just less competitive, you know, shall we say. And, and, you know, and, uh, and that's to me is always a good place to start if you can find the right, uh, the right use case. Yeah. Now this, this may be too big and broad of a question, but so, okay, you pick a domain, um, and you are an early stage found, like basically it's you and maybe you have a, another person who wants to start a company with you. Um, how would you go about starting a robotics company? 
Like, how, what would you think would be the, what would be an efficient path to get growing and everything? Um, yeah, I mean, I think finding the right team is probably a good place to start, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I think having somebody with, you know, the combination of technical expertise and domain expertise are, are kind of the, the magic combination here, uh, where you have somebody that does understand the market and can go and talk to potential customers and kind of, uh, validate ideas and things like that, along with a technical co-founder who can, you know, build the initial, or at least lead the creation of the initial prototypes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, again, like these are in general are systems that, you know, that would just require more resources. It's not, you know, necessarily one person who can, you know, sit and code up the prototype, but, but that being said, there's a lot more off the shelf stuff that you can buy, you know, off the shelf robotic arms, off the shelf, you know, small, uh, uh, small vehicles, you know, things like that, that you can at least build, uh, initial prototypes on top of. Um, and so, but I, th I think the starting point is definitely to figure out, you know, what, you know, what problem you're trying to solve, right. And having somebody on the team who comes with, you know, a, a deep understanding, you know, of the industry and then can go and, you know, kind of go deep and, um, you know, talk to potential customers and validate ideas before getting too far, you know, in terms of, you know, building, building stuff. Cause you can waste a lot of time building stuff that nobody wants. Um, I, I definitely, think that can be a very expensive proposition. Mm -hmm. And then how do you, um, I suppose some people or some small teams may need to seek funding early just to like start working on something. Um, but when, when do you think companies should go for a seed round or a series a funding? Like how, how do you know you're ready for either of those rounds? Um, I think today for series A, at least like you need to have, um, initial customers, right? I think it's very hard mm -hmm. if you don't have a, it doesn't have to be the final machine or device, but you need to have a device that's probably gone through a couple of iterations, you know, is, is, is good enough for people to deploy, you know, ideally in some initial production use cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and start to use and validate that it works, that it delivers ROI and that the customer is excited about it. You know, I think these are, there's no like, you know, revenue That's it. You have to get there. or whatever, but yeah, you, know, you want, you know, at least one and ideally at least a couple customers who have used it, who are using it, happy to use it, you know, every day, um, you know, uh, and are getting value, demonstrable value. Um, I think that's kind of the bar for a, a series A at least. Um, mm -hmm. And seed, you know, the, I think seed can be kind of all over the map, right? I mean, there, there are plenty of seed investors that will invest in just a business plan. You know, here's a, you know, here's mm -hmm. a PowerPoint presentation with a cup, you know, with, with our idea, our idea, you know, that's typically, you know, for more kind of proven entrepreneurs, so to speak, like maybe you've already built a business before, or you, you know, you are an early employee at Kiva, you know, and so you have, you have some credibility, you know, around, mm -hmm. you know, around what you're trying to build, um, you know, everything to, okay, yeah, we've built the initial prototype, you know, we've done some proof of concept to demonstrate viability, you know, things like that, you know, um, uh, can, uh, may, may be required. Uh, and there are a bunch of, you know, there are all sorts of labels for, you know, friends and family rounds and pre-seed yep. rounds and seed rounds. So there are all, all, all sorts of labels, but um, I think it, it, it's very uh, situational, uh, if you will, you know, depending on, you know, your own kind of credibility as an entrepreneur, um, you know, the team that you've built, the use case that you're going after, and, and frankly, just finding an investor with whom all of those things resonate. Yeah, definitely. And then for the person or the group starting a company, what should they look for in an investor? Do you just want anyone who will give you money? But I'm sure you have some expertise. Well, I'm sure you're yeah, you probably have... a good starting point to get somebody yeah, go who's going to give you money. But um, definitely, yeah. I mean, I think there are. I mean, there are definitely more and more um, uh, investors that are active in robotics. So I, I always tell people that the you know if, like you can go and try to meet every investor out there, right? But I think the most productive path uh, at the end of the day is going to be number one investors that have done deals in this space before right so they're not they're not you know just kind of hey i'm going to take a flyer on my first robotics company <laughs> uh, but rather oh yeah we've done two or three we kind of understand you know what this looks like right because it has its own somewhat unique dynamic in terms of um you know the, the path and as i said like oftentimes for a series a there's like the series a 
extension and maybe there's multiple series A extensions, right? So you want ideally a series A investor who has the you know ability you know to do that and willingness to you know put more money on in you know before a proper series B, right? So that may be a slightly larger fund. Um, but you know, so I think you know getting investors that have experience in the category that understand you know what it means, what what these businesses look like you know, who's, you know, able and willing to, you know, support, you know, the company through, you know, uh, potentially a couple of different rounds before they raise their next major round. Um, if they have, you know, experience in related spaces, I think it can always be helpful. So, you know, obviously you don't want an, an investor who's invested in a competitor, but, you know, they've done a couple of deals in logistics and I have a logistics startup, you know, so they kind of understand mm -hmm. and they can be helpful actually, you know, is like the, you know, even better, right? They can help you think about how to do go to market, you know, because they have other companies that have sold into lo the logistics space. And so they can be, you know, helpful for how you think about your own, you know, go to market strategy, for example. Um, so, so I think these are like the basic, you know, starting point. Uh, and as I said, I think there's just more and more such investors out there. So at least the the opportunity set is 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 getting wider, which is which is great. Uh, and then it's just a matter of again just finding the right you know the right party, which you uh, who's excited about your vision. Hell yeah, awesome. Let's see. Um, going back to the state of robotics report, was there anything in it that you found that was particularly surprising? Um. Yeah, and I think when we did it last year, I think this, again, this kind of uh, shift from AV to vertical robotics was, I think we intuitively kind of thought it, but it was it. kind of, yeah. you know, it was, it was uh, surprising how rapidly the shift was happening uh, in some ways. Um, you know, so I think that kind of reinforced our own view and kind of gave some um, further impetus for us to say, hey, yeah, this is made probably the right place to be focusing our efforts. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second thing was that the exit markets were still really early. You know, there were, you know, probably fewer exits than I might have imagined um, mm -hmm. in a sense. And, and again, I think it comes back to, you know, we're still in the very early days of this market. You know, it's only a few years old in some ways, at least from a venture capital uh, perspective. Um, and so, um, you know, the, just the, the number of exits was, it is small, you know, and hopefully it'll grow, go bigger, but it was probably a little bit smaller than I, uh, that I quite anticipated. Um, again, I think that is changing and will change, you know, pretty rapidly, but um, I think that was, uh, that was a little surprising. And then, you know, the, the third thing was, again, this, this, this kind of, you know, what I call like the squeeze in the series B and C, uh. you know, which is, you know, there are uh, a lot of, there is a lot of excitement in the early, so even like Y Combinator, you know, is kind of like the, you know, the the bellwether of all early stage investing, you know, as robotics is one of their core focus areas this time, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there's obviously a lot of early stage excitement, but, you know, the, the, the difficulties of range of raising the series B and C was probably more pronounced than I, uh, that I fully uh, appreciated. But, but again, I think it, I, I think it's just, it just puts a focus on, you know, getting to the right metrics, you know, getting to the right proof points, you know, in a way that probably didn't, ex you know, that wasn't as critical a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Did you see any evolution between the last year one, the last year's report and this year's report? Like, was there any, any vectors of how things are changing? Uh, I mean, uh, 2021 was just an anomaly in general. And so yeah. I think everything was looking great then. Uh, 2023 was, sort of more of the same of 2022, but just smaller, um, a lot yeah. smaller, right? I mean, if, if you look at the market overall, I think even like, I think 2022 itself was off like 30, 40%. And then 2023 was off yet another, you know, 40, 50% off. Wow. It's pretty marked how, how much it's fallen. Although a lot of that's been just been driven by uh, the kind of the, the drop in autonomous vehicle investing. Um, if mm -hmm. you look at you know, this vertical robotics, as we call it, uh, that's that has definitely shrank, but not as much as, as the rest of the market. Gotcha. What do you expect um, if you look out another year? Do you expect that trend to continue? Do you expect it to pick back up a little bit? Any thoughts um, there? I, I mean, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, 2023 will be the kind of the bottoming of the market, you know, in, in a way. So uh, things will start to pick up again. Um, again, I think, I think, you know, entrepreneurs have, have heard, you know, from the market as to what they need to focus on. And so I think they'll just be way more focused on, you know, delivering. I mean, these are all super talented people. Uh, and so, you know, I think they will, you know, kind of adjust their own strategies to deliver on, you know, some of the expectations that people have. And so they'll just be better equipped to, 
to raise money as well. Um, and so, mm. um, and, and as I said, like the, 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 the early stage activity is hopefully a precursor for later stage activity, right? I mean, just the sheer yep. number of companies that are raising, like they, those, you know, they won't all be successful, but a lot of them will be successful. And there's been a lot of money that's gone into those companies in the last two, three years. So those, as those companies mature, uh, I imagine there'll be a lot of, you know, high quality companies coming out, you know, ready to raise their B and C and, and so forth. So, um, so again, I, I mean, I, we're optimistic, you know, again, I, I think that, uh the the last year in some ways was sort of a wake-up call for uh, for founders in terms of what is it you know what do they really should focus on you know mm -hmm. from a business building perspective um and you know I, I i would think and hope that you know 2024 and beyond will you know things will start to pick up again gotcha um and what do you make of the y combinator um where they're focusing on robotics like i, I think that's very exciting but what are your thoughts on it um yeah, I mean, I I feel like, and I you know I'm no expert on Y Combinator, but my my general sense is that they've over the last few years. I mean, they started you know I mean in the early days it was all about you know kind of consumer software and then enterprise software. And I think it, I think they've always been uh, kind of a, hopefully like a step ahead of kind of what the next trends are in the market. Oh. And so you've definitely seen um, a lot more focus you know for Y Combinator on kind of emerging segments of venture. You know, not the traditional. You know, what's your next consumer app or what's your next, you know, piece of yeah. enterprise software? Like that's always there and, you know, it always will be there. But, you know, you see them talking a lot more about, you know, climate related startups or, you know, robotics in this example, or, you know, they were probably early to the crypto craze, you know, like all, all of that kind of stuff. I think they were there, you know, not that they, they didn't, may not get it right all the time, but I think they're just sort of a leading indicator of, of what, you know, kind of what investors, you know, are going to be, ex are, are excited about, you know, in, in the, in the go forward times. Cause again, like investment is all ideally about betting on the future, not on the past. Right. And so you want to find kind of the next, you know, the next big thing, so to speak, um, as opposed to just kind of replicating what was successful in the, uh, and not always just replicating what was successful in the past. Definitely. And then wrapping up, what do you imagine for the future? Like wh where do you think robotics is going to be in 10 years? say? Uh, really hard to predict. I mean, I think that, I mean, technology is changing pretty rapidly. Um, it's true. You know, and so I think just the capability of what these systems can do, you know, is, uh, I mean, I think it's hard to envision exactly, <laughs> you know, what that's going to look like. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, as you, as, yeah, I just think that the, the the range of use cases will start to expand significantly. I think today, to some extent, like the use cases are kind of constrained by what the technology today enables, right? Um, I think as the technology, you know, uh, expands in terms of, you know, because it's all about like modern robotics is all about dealing with unstructured environments fundamentally, right? Historically, you know, the robotics that existed for the last 50 years was around highly structured environments doing highly structured things. It wasn't about perceiving the environment. It was about, you know, move this, uh, this role, this motor from, you know, point A to point B. Right. And that, and just do that over and over and over again. And that's what it was very structured, very predefined. Now it's all about unstructured environments. Like how do you navigate, you know, in the real world? And I think that, ability is going to continue to expand, right? Like the ability to perceive the world and kind of deal with uncertainty, you know, is obviously kind of the core of what, you know, modern AI is is enabling uh, us to do. And so I think that just opens the, you know, the, the range of use cases in a much uh, increasingly broader, uh, bigger way. So I think, I think there would be two things. I mean, one is like these companies that have been funded today, like not all of them, but a lot of them will become really successful, you know, like they will start to be out there, you'll start to see them you know, maybe not on their sidewalk, but certainly if you go to a factory or you go to a farm or you go to a construction site, I think the, you know, they'll be much more ubiquitous, you know, than what you see today. And then number two, I think you'll start to see, you know, all sorts of uh, use cases that you could never have imagined that a robot could do because they have been enabled by, you know, much more sophisticated, you know, perception capabilities. Awesome. All right, Sanjay, thank you. Uh, this is great speaking to you and hearing your perspective. Yeah, thank you very much for the time. It was, it was a fun chat. You made it. What do you think? Are you as bullish on robotics as Sanjay? Isn't it surprising that there have only been 25 or so robotics exits above 250 million? What do you think the timeline is for a 10 times increase in this number? I bet it will be faster than we think. If you want to check out the State of Robotics report, 
The link will be in the description. See you next time.